What are Xenobots? Uh, Xenobots, um, there's a couple of different ways to think about them. I'll tell you what they physically are, but, but, that, but I don't think that's really what they are. <laughs> physically, what they are, are um, and this is, this is work that was uh, pioneered in my lab by Douglas Blackiston and uh, our close collaborators, Josh Bongard um, uh, and uh, Sam Kriegman in, at the University of Vermont to do the, all the co um, computational parts of this work. So um, xenobots are what you get when you liberate frog epithelial cells from the rest of the body. Now, it's a weird way to engineer because instead of adding something, we don't add materials, we don't add scaffolds, no bioengineered synthetic circuits. Um, we're not uh, uh, editing the genome. We're, we're not adding anything. What, we are, what we're doing is removing the influences that normally hack these cells to have a, a, a boring life as the two-dimensional outer covering of a frog embryo, right? This, 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 the skin. So this is one of the ways that you discover new uh, intelligence and unfamiliar guises is that you take away various constraints and you ask, what is, what is it capable of doing when you're not making it do specific things? What, what does it want to do, so to speak? So, so it turns out that if you liberate these prospective skin cells from a frog embryo, what they do is they could do many things. They could crawl away from each other. They could die. They could make a two-dimensional monolayer like in cell culture. Instead, what they do is they come together in, in a little ball. They organize such that um, the, the cilia, the little hairs that uh, on the outside of cells that, that normally move the mucus down the body of the frog, the hairs are pointing outward. And what it, what it does is it becomes self-motile because it uses the little hairs to, to, to um, row against the water. So it starts, it starts zipping around. And it has, is, it is, so, so we call them xenobots because Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog, the, the spe frog species that we use. I think it's a, among many other things, it's a biorobotics platform. And so that's why we call them xenobots. But, um, the, and, and, and so, so first, what, what are they, why, why is it interesting? What do they do? Well, well, first of all, they, they do a number, they, they, um, they express about 900 genes differently than the normal frog embryos do. Um, some of those, some of those genes, for example, relate to hearing. And we, we said, why, why, do they, why are these things suddenly expressing genes related to hearing? Well, it turns out that if you put a speaker under the dish of the xenobots, you can communicate to them with sound. You can make, you can make sound and they will change their behaviors uh, because, because they, can, they can sense the vibrations. Right? So normal embryos don't do that. So, so, so they have this new lifestyle. They're sort of zipping around. They have the ability to, to um, interact in new ways with signals from the environment. They also do this crazy thing called kinematic replication. So what happens is we, we've made it impossible for them to uh, reproduce in the normal froggy way, right? Because they don't have any of those tissues. But it turns out that if you um, provide them, if you sprinkle a bunch of loose skin cells into the dish, and so you provide them with this material, what they do is they run around and they collect the material into piles and they, and they polish these piles into little balls. And because they're dealing with an agential material, meaning living cells that are not passive, the way that robot parts are passive, the, the balls themselves become the next generation of xenobots. And when they mature, guess what they do? They run around and do the same thing and you get the next generation. So they do this crazy kinematic self-replication. It's kind of von Neumann's dream of a robot that goes around and makes copies of itself from stuff it finds in the environment. But notice, notice something really important. Um, there's never been selection to be a good xenobot. No other creature on earth does kinematic replication. It's never been in their history to do that. Where, where does it come from? Because normally when you ask about the shape and behavior of an organism, the answer is, oh, selection. Uh, you know, millions of years of, of being selected to do this and that. Well, there hasn't been any xenobots. And, and I don't know if you're going to get into this, but we also made anthrobots, which is a similar thing made from adult human cells. And they do some amazing things, too. Again, there hasn't been any there, there's never been any anthrobots. There's never been any selection to be a good anthrobot. So so one of the things that. Um, OK, so now we come back to the question, what what are xenobots? So so here's a list of here's a list of what they are. First of all, they are, um, you can say that they're the actual thing, the physical thing that's running around doing all these things. That's the xenobot. You can say that. Another thing you could say, which I think is, is, is a little more, more profound, is you could say the xenobot is a platform. It's a collection of us as the scientists, the cellular material that goes into it, the AI that the Bongard lab made to help us uh, create different kinds of xenobots. All of that, the xenobot is all of that. The xenobot is the whole, the, the system as a whole. Okay, it's the it's the it's the whole discovery platform. The third thing you could say is that no, actually, what they are are an exploration tool for the latent space of possibilities. Normally, we see the frog embryo, which is the one outcome, and people think, well, that's what the frog genome knows how to do. It knows how to make this this frog embryo. Well, no, turns out that hardware, that genetically specified hardware, can make other things. And so now, well, how do you know what else it can make? 
And so now we need to make tools to 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 explore the latent space or what I've called the platonic space of of, of forms that that control um, uh, and and shape uh, both both anatomy and, and behavior. You can you can use xenobots, anthrobots, and various other things like this that are not the products of evolution to explore that space to answer the question: Well, where did that come from? I, I don't I don't think it's an accident, and I don't think. Uh, saying that it's emergent, that doesn't really do anything for us. I think much better is to say that there is a structured space out there that we can um, that we can uh, study using these kinds of things as, as exploration tools. So the Xenobot, I think, is all of those things. It is also a fourth thing. It is a uh, it is a proto organism. It is a, an embodied uh, primitive intelligence, which we are only now beginning to understand what are its actual capabilities. Uh, it can learn. It has it has memory capacity. It can do a couple of other things. Um, and that means that it's telling us, it's something that's telling us about important uh, things that we didn't know about how novel beings come into the world, beings that don't have an evolutionary history, but yet they have goals, they have um, some degree of uh, cognitive performance, uh, and, uh, and, and they're telling us uh, to really get serious about developing new forms of, of ethics, of being able to relate to beings that are not like us. Not only not like us, but also not on the evolutionary tree with us. So, so you can't use the traditional method of of determining how you're going to relate to someone by looking at where they are on the tree and saying, "I'm going to treat them such and such because they're way back or they're close to us or, or whatever." It's not that doesn't work anymore. So, so all of these things—that's what they are. They're all of those things. Mm-hmm.